Well, I'm glad to see you are very much working with houses that have a south-facing roof. Um, that's, the, that's a very good start to work with. Um, passive solar, active solar. Um, we, uh, we often cringe when we get into the, uh, the suburbs and we look at houses that are cattywampus and have many additions and dormers and multiple structures on them and the homeowners are really driven because they want to do renewables but they just don't have a site. Um, so I'm going to back up a step. My name is Dustin Dennison. Uh, I'm a board member with the Minnesota Renewable Energy Society. I'm also a board member with Mencia, which is the Minnesota Solar Energy Industry Association, which is, for the first time in our state, the lobbying arm for solar at the Capitol. And uh, I'm not going to get too deep into that, uh, but we do have uh, two bills that are at the Capitol right now working their way through legislation. There are actually six bills at the Capitol, specifically around uh, renewable energy and specifically solar. Uh, it is essentially the largest energy policy bill in the last 12 years in the state of Minnesota that we are trying to work through with our legislators. Um, so I've described the two hats I work with. The other third hat that I wear is my hat as principal with Applied Energy Innovations. And we are a mechanical, electrical, uh, plumbing contractor in South Minneapolis, specifically focused on renewables and energy efficiency. Um, <clears throat> looking at some of the houses you had up there, we, our company did a SIP wall construction in um, Columbia Heights. And this was about probably five years ago. Um, the case study on that house that we did after completion uh, was a 6,000 square foot house, SIP wall, um, if you're familiar with SIP wall construction, um, came out to a uh, annual heating bill of approximately $45. Um, this was in the dead of winter to heat and it was a 97.5 efficient furnace that we put in there. So great construction when everything is done right, everything is laid out right. Um, these are incredible projects and uh, they're really truly testimonies to using uh, both the technology of today in building construction and using the technologies of passive um, sun and solar uh, dating back thousands of years. So with that, I'm going to give a brief, brief description uh, of MRES. Um, again, the Minnesota Renewable Energy Society uh, is a member organization that's been around for 30 years, and we go out and we do education and outreach uh, with members, students, communities, uh, teaching about um, not only what our organization does, but really what the full potential of using renewables such as wind, geothermal, and solar can do for properties and buildings. Um, Organization, as I said, has been around for 30 years. It's a 501c3. Our mission is to advance a sustainable society and renewable energy economy through education, leadership, and example. Now, I've got about 52 slides that I'm not going to torture you with, but what I am going to dive deep into really is talk about what, what our solar resource is in the state of Minnesota and also some of the technologies that are out there. And then I'm going to take my MRES hat off and I'll show you some of the projects briefly that AEI that we lay out, we incorporate with um, both commercial properties and residential properties. A um, little bit about, again, MRES uh, hosts a, a whole number of events. I want to encourage you guys uh, at some point, go Google MRES, take a look at the solar boat regatta that we do. Uh, the Minnesota Solar Tour in October is a great, great opportunity to go out and take a look at uh, where solar technology is being implemented. Uh, eco experience at the State Fair. Anybody been to the eco experience? Raise the hands. Oh, you guys got to get out there and check out the building. North side of, uh, uh, of the fairgrounds, the eco experience building. And we do, Doug, how many outreach events do we do a year approximately? About 70 to 80. About 70 80 outreach events. We go out and we do tabling and we partner up with our uh, partner organizations. Uh, what is renewables? Uh, we've got solar electric, solar thermal, wind energy, wave energy, tidal, geothermal, biomass, and hydro. Uh, some of the pictures you're going to see in this presentation, as was mentioned earlier, we have great Minnesota manufacturers producing solar panels right here in Minnesota. There's actually five manufacturers producing an array of solar thermal, solar PV, and solar hot air uh, panels and modules. Um, I'm going to jump into our resource for solar. Uh, when we take a look at uh, solar radiation that comes in, 
Um, and this is in units, uh, all current global energy consumption sources. Um, small cubes, the fraction of each source that is technically, economically, and, e and ecologically exploitable now. We see that compared to these other resources, water, geothermal, we have an abundance of sun that hits the earth that we can use. Solar energy is sustainable. Um, you know, unlike, <laughs> unlike uh, for example, hydro. You know, we're going to have fluctuations what we can do with hydro. We're going to have fluctuations with other technologies, whether it's biomass. You know, do we have enough wood pulp or do we have enough organic matter to, to burn to create energy? We know that solar is a great uh, peak resource in the summer when we, when we need it to achieve our, our loads, our electrical loads. Minnesota's energy resources. Uh, in Minnesota, we have a solar window, a resource similar to Houston, Texas, and similar to Tallahassee, Florida. In wind, uh, we're fourth in the U.S. generation. I actually, I believe that statistic, uh, since Jan created this slide, I think we're down to eighth now. We might even be a little bit lower. Uh, but we are eighth in the United States for wind generation. Biomass, we're first in biofuel production. Fossil fuels, guess what? We have no natural gas, we have no oil, and we have no coal. It's pretty amazing. Think about that. Does anybody know where our coal comes from? All of our coal comes from the Becker coal fields in North Dakota. Anybody know where our oil comes from? Canada. Anybody know where our natural gas comes from? Canada. So think about this. The U.S. Department of Energy, the DOE, has done a study, and we know that the state of Minnesota, we import $20 billion a year of raw resources into this state to run turbines to create energy. Think about that. $20 billion a year because we don't have coal, we don't have natural gas, we don't have shale fracking fields in Minnesota, we don't have um, oil. So but pretty... Is that for all energy or just electrical energy? Uh, that is for... Describe your difference. Um, well, you said literally like burning to turn turbines. To Correct. Yep. To make electricity, right? Okay. So it's not including green jobs like household residential oil. Uh, it is. It is, yep. All costs, all costs to create energy. Um, but we do know what we do have is we have a great solar resource here in Minnesota. Uh, if we look at um, Germany and the lower right-hand corner here, um, we have a better solar window than Germany. Anybody know what they're doing in Germany right now in terms of producing renewables and a percentage of their country? They hit a peak last year that was 50% of the country's energy was generated in a one weekend event. So they are on par to meet some massive RES standards. Everybody familiar with the renewable energy standard? I'm not gonna get too deep into it, but Minnesota has an RES portfolio. It's a renewable energy standard that by the year 2025, Minnesota, through our legislation, we are mandated, our utility companies will produce 25% of their energy by 2025. What we're doing at the Capitol is we're going above and beyond saying that 10% on top of the 25 should be created just by using solar. And what our concern is, is we don't want to get to 2025, turn the corner and realize, you know what, we met our standards, but we did it all with wind. Wind is fast, wind is easy, but solar also has an incredible opportunity because we can't put up wind turbines inside the city. Uh, we talked about U.S. biomass resources. We do have a lot of bio, bio resources in Minnesota. The wind, a lot of our wind resources on the western uh, side of the state. Uh, U.S. oil and gas production. Big white pocket right in, right in the Minnesota there. Uh, U.S. coal resources, same thing. And if we actually had a um, shale field, uh, gas and oil, uh, it would look very close to the, um, uh, the coal map here. Uh, industry growth. We know that solar is, is growing very, very fast. Uh, module costs are dropping. Um, since we've been in the industry, um, the last four years, we've seen the cost of solar PV modules um, 
easily drop by a third, almost a half, just in material cost, and that's over a four-year period. We know that the DOE, uh, the government, is on a course to reduce the soft cost of installation. That would be things such as your permitting, um, such as your interconnection agreements. Uh, grid parity, uh, that's the point of basically reaching the cost of producing energy using solar is the same as what you would buy your electricity currently right now. And I'm going to tag on to that real quick. Um, one of the things going through the capital is called a VOS. It's a value of solar. We've taken this model from Austin, Texas, and this is important because this is going to be a game changer. In my generation, in your generation, we are seeing the biggest paradigm shift with utility companies right now. Right now, they have admitted that their sales are flat. And they're not happy about that. And the reason being, because all you people are putting in CFLs, and you're putting in your Energy Star appliances, and guess what? That's, that's starting to pinch the utility company pretty hard. Um, what a VOS is, value of solar, is putting a market rate to the energy produced by solar. When we talk about coal, we look at all the inputs that go into producing electricity using coal. We have extraction out of the ground. We have transportation using rail freight. We have a massive carbon that's produced um, at the turbines. Uh, we also have transmission line loss. We have all these things that occur. When we look at using solar on projects, we know that it creates local jobs. It can support a local economy. It's often the production of solar is matched to a peak time of day when we need it the most. Uh, we also have a product that can produce energy without putting uh, carbon into the atmosphere. So what we're saying is you in our generation we have a choice. You're going to decide, am I going to produce, am I going to pay for a kilowatt hour of energy that's produced by coal, solar, or wind? And right now the big argument at the capital is, is what is the cost of that VOS going to be? What is it going to cost on that 10% energy standard from now to 2030? And uh, I think what you're going to find out is in your decision making process, Excel Energy just did a 9% interim rate increase for one year. 9%. Now, what's interesting is that doesn't address really what's going on with the nuclear capacity in the state and what we're doing with storage around nuclear. So um, we know that we can do a 10% solar energy standard at a cost of 1.33% between now and 2030. So it really is going to come down to where and how we get our electricity produced. So I'm going to go into some, some easy design stuff. Here's a cutout. You can see where renewables falls into the big picture. Uh, petroleum, 37%. Natural gas, 25%. Coal, 21%. Nuclear electric is 9%. Renewable energy has this little sliver over here. And you can see of that sliver, do you see where solar falls in? 1%. 1 percent. 1% of that 8%. 1% of the 8%, correct. Yep. Just a small sliver. Uh, growth of world energy demand, we know that the, the growth, growth is going to continue to rise. Um, uh, where we get our power is a great example. This is Excel Energy. 46% um, from coal, 27% nuclear, natural gas 5%, hydro 9.3, wind 7.7. .7. And, and I'm sorry, the previous slide was a U.S. slide. This is a Minnesota-specific slide. And you can see right in there, uh, biomass, uh, refuse-derived fuel, oil. We don't even have a sliver in there for solar right now. But that's changing. That's changing in a, in a big scale. Uh, how clean is our energy? I'm not going to get too deep into this, but we know that producing energy with different resources has an effect on our environment. Whether it's carbon production, whether it's the release of chemicals or mercury into the environment, it all has an effect. Air pollution from solar power, zero. Uh, we often like to talk about the, um, uh, the renewables and energy efficiency, the pyramid. And uh, for those of you that can remember the food pyramid way back when, the government came out with this nice food, period and food pyramid and helped us define what and how we should be eating. Well, this is what we like to think of in our energy efficiency and renewable pyramid. And this pyramid really starts out with um, 
low cost, no cost, uh, lighting, even understanding our energy needs and consumption to air sealing, to appliances, uh, water heating, heating and cooling, windows, and at the top of the pyramid, you've got your renewable options. Why is that important? Is because we don't want to be putting solar and renewables on buildings that are leaking massive amounts of heat, air, or energy. We need to address those first. Solar technology, 3,000 years ago. Passive solar heating and cooling today. So we'll get into some brief design stuff, and I'll pull up a couple slides of uh, projects that we've worked on. Um, we have some of the, the standard fundamentals of direct passive solar heating. Um, solar chimney for passive cooling. Uh, we've actually got a project in um, Seward neighborhood where the gentleman has about, I want to say about three tons of crushed granite under his property where he takes in solar air heat off the third story of his uh, glass atrium and then he pipes it down into an air duct distribution where he charges this rock field underneath his house. Solar hydronic collectors. So we're going to talk a little bit about the different technologies and I heard uh, some of you speak about solar thermal, some of you speak about solar PV and admittedly, yes, I would agree, solar thermal is kind of our redheaded stepchild. It's a great, great technology. Solar thermal hot water, we can do a lot with it. The problem is it's the incentive culture right now between getting solar thermal really into the marketplace. Um, the culture we have with, with little to no incentives behind solar thermal uh, makes it a very pricey option. Uh, myself being a big solar thermal fan, uh, because we use that in our mechanicals, we can do space heating, we can do in-floor um, heating, uh, we can do domestic hot water heating such as your uh, showers, your dishes, your laundry. There's a lot we can do with that. And the technologies around being able to store solar thermal energy are getting really exciting on how we can use that energy long term. But for example, solar hydronic collectors. This is solar thermal. We're using flat plate collectors on the left. And again, this is typically in our climate using a glycol solution that is essentially an antifreeze and it's doing that loop between the mechanical room and the roof so it doesn't freeze and we're taking that energy out of these solar thermal collectors and these are the evacuated tubes we're bringing that down to a tank that has a heat exchanger and we're taking that BTU energy and putting it directly into domestic water or into a space heating application. Solar water heating. I mentioned we have products made here in Minnesota. Uh, solar Skies is made up in Alexandria. Uh, we also have our reel. This is made up in Pine River. This is a solar hot air collector. It's really nice about these solar hot air collectors um, is uh, uh, the aesthetics and how it looks. This is a radius wall. This is actually their property up in Pine River. And um, it's a great fit for taking care of properties well insulated where we can take that, that air inside the house, run it through the absorber plate, boost it up anywhere from 40 to 60 degrees and put it back into the house. Now there's some real important design criteria when you get into solar hot air. You know, two panels is typical for heating uh, approximately 400 square feet. Uh, when you take a look at this type of application, you're going to want to size your property or your structure uh, to get the most either out in the front end when you design it, the most out of how many modules and panels you can get on a south-facing surface. This technology, you noticed, is not on a roof. This is directly on a south-facing wall. And the reason being is we're taking advantage of the declination of the sun so that it's striking that wall so that we don't have to worry in the summer that this wall is picking up a massive heat load because we know in the summer the sun's going to be much higher and it's not going to be directly striking these panels because what we don't want to do is we don't want to create a heat sink into the building on a 90 degree day. So what else are we doing with solar? Well, we're actually putting people uh, uh, up, in, up, in the, um, uh, up in the air flying, I think this is the second or third operable 
uh, airplane that is up running. And you can Google any of this stuff. It's, it's out there. It's pretty amazing, the technology. I'm not sure if this one was using batteries or not. I would assume it is of some sort. But um, you know, there's not too much to this. Solar electric technology, um, sodal voltaic PV. Sodal voltaic PV is silicon, monocrystalline or polycrystalline, multi-junction, thin film. These are the types of technologies. Solar domestic water heating, solar thermal space heating, and concentrating solar. We've got concentrating PV and concentrating thermal electric. Uh, the term concentrating is where we're taking parabolic dishes and we're reflecting sun essentially on a collector tube that will have any number of uh, either a glycol or a molten salt in it. And then what's happening is that fluid is traveling through that collector tube and it's being again transferred as a BTU uh, transfer source. Solar PV technology. Multi-junction up to 42% efficient. Researchers targeting 60% efficiency. Uh, high cost could be $3 a watt in the future. Um, we're looking at um, technologies right now. Everything from the thin films, which I think you're going to start to see um, maybe the industry start to shift a little bit away from. Um, there's been a lot of talk about um, building incorporated technologies and those are going to be solar that's incorporated into the actual building components and building structures versus an accessory add-on. Um, silicon monocrystalline is 15 to 24 percent efficient. Polycrystalline is 12 to 19 percent efficient. Uh, $3, $3 a watt modules retail in 2011. I will tell you right now, $3 a watt module, modules, we have costs coming across our office, across our desk every day. This is 2011. The costs are now down below a dollar. We're at about approximately 88 cents a watt. So that's a huge, huge change. Uh, we talked a little bit about thin films are less efficient. Uh, thin films also have, um, do not have the life longevity of a traditional uh, module. Solar electric in Minnesota. So we have a lot of design architectural concepts we can put in here. We have a pergola mount you can see um, on the left. That is with a Minnesota made module at Silicon Energy made up in northern Minnesota. Uh, on the right side you can see another installation there. I believe that is a uh, picture taken at their Washington State facility. These are cool panels because there's glass on both sides. And actually, actually, they're not very well. Yep. They're, they're pricey, but they're quite pricey. They are very pricey. This is a glass on glass module. It's really kind of considered the Cadillac module in the industry. Uh, it's very well uh, heavily supported with the current rebates that are in place. Uh, it has a 20% light transmission through there. So, what you can see here is you can see the shading underneath the arbor and it's allowing about 20 percent light to come through and there's been a lot of creative things that we've done with this you can put gutters on the tail end of it you can collect rainwater that comes off it we have 10k solar this is a product made in bloomington minnesota so just on the south side of minneapolis here this is a commercial self ballasted uh, array and it's a great uh, plug-and-play array which means basically if you've got the roof space you can drop uh, 40 kW of this right on the roof our engineers will come in we'll do the engineering the structural review we'll take a look at the weight loading we'll do a ballast layout which is we have to ballast it with additional rocks or blocks sits on top yep very nice very easy um, and here's a ground mount um, this is for uh, this is an agribusiness application um, so it's very versatile we can use this technology anywhere um, agribusiness is a huge huge market opportunity for our industry when we take a look at what the consumption is that takes place in dairy farms or we take a look at what takes place um, even if um, chicken poultry facilities. Um, if we take a look at what's going on with the uh, butchering or the rendering, uh, these are incredible opportunities where they're using massive, massive amounts of energy. 
Justin, can you describe what's happening on the back side of the top two screens? Yep. Um, so this particular product, this is the 10K solar. And what it is, is there's a reflector on the back of this. It is a, again, a 3M Minnesota made reflector. It's a thin film, uh, basically on a piece of glass. And what's happening is, there's an actual curve, a 12 month curve. Once we get past um, the solstice, when that sun starts to come up higher in the sky, it's gonna send down light radiation off this panel. And that thin film is specifically designed not to reflect heat. It's reflecting a certain wavelength, which um, I don't know because it's a proprietary information. But what they're doing is they're actually boosting the production on the back of each of these modules. They're boosting their production by reflecting light directly on the PV modules behind them. And we see typically uh, about a 30% gain in production with this type of uh, technology. Solar resource, great thing to think about when we are talking about incorporating solar onto properties. You know, we have a uh, winter sunset, winter sunrise, when our sun is so low. We also have our summer sunrise and summer sunset when it's traveling directly above our house. Um, you know, what we want is, ideally, we want a property that's gonna have a nice, nice south-facing roof. What we do is we typically, we go out as solar installers, I'm gonna take my MRES hat off, and we'll go out with what's called a Pathfinder. And we'll physically take this device, this Pathfinder, we'll go up on the roof, and we'll shoot, with this Pathfinder, we'll shoot four images on each of the four corners of the roof. What happens is, is that we take those images back into our office, and it actually, we take a picture, it looks exactly like this. And what you can see is, you see the blue line of the sky around there? And right here is a tree. We're actually tracing this image when we get back into our office, and we're transferring it into a mathematical formula. These rings here represent each month of the year. And each month of the year, there's an hour on here. As it goes from, uh, you've got solar noon right here, one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock. You know, we essentially want a pie shape. Right here, four and a half hours is our optimum sun window in the state of Minnesota. So we'll take this back into our office and we'll crunch the data and we'll come up with percentages and we'll take the solar modules, which are all engineered and they have engineered data behind them. We will match a solar module, one of about 1,200 modules that are on the market right now. We'll take that engineered data we will put it into the software and it'll tell us exactly what our solar potential and we'll run it through PV watts and we'll know exactly how much uh, solar electricity this property and this product can deliver. Not only in a 12 month time span, but we can predict it out to 25 years. And what happens is we take in the degradation of the panel and we take in any other factors such as shading, such as overcast, snow, all of that comes into it mathematical computation where we can put a guarantee and say yes this installation will produce X amount of dollars per year for the next 20 years. Uh, big challenge with, with, with the technology right now has been the solar financing. Um, so there's a lot of creative things that are going on. A lot of people want to incorporate the technology into their property uh, the big challenge has been around how to do it, especially when we have some of the rebates involved. Excel uh, does not allow a third party lease agreement uh, on their properties. So, you know, the reason we don't have big corporations in here like Solar City America or One Block Off the Grid installing solar is because of this third party lease agreement. Um, part of what's going through the capital right now is going to change the dynamics and remove that language. So we are looking at parts of this bill, if this gets approved, bringing in exponential growth into the Minnesota marketplace. We have a Minnesota net metering law. What does that mean? Well, net metering law was established approximately, well, back in 1983. The law applies to all investor-owned utilities, municipal utilities, and electric cooperatives. Utility 
Utilities pay ratepayer for net excess generation at retail rate. All qualifying facilities less than 40 kilowatts KW in capacity are eligible. There is no limit on statewide capacity. What does all that mean? It means that any excess energy that you produce, by law, the utility companies are required to buy back. Now, in Excel Energy, in their case, as part of their rebate structure, they will only allow us to design and install up to 120% of capacity. So if that property, and we go back 12 months and look at the prior year's electrical consumption, that'll tell us what their usage is. And we have to provide that to Excel Energy. We also, again, we cannot design above that 120% threshold. So basically, there's a 20% cushion for us to go above and beyond and truly get them net neutral so they can actually get a check back at the end of each month. And I would say approximately 85% of the projects we do, our projects are all net neutral or our customers receive money back at the end of the year on each of the installations. Yep. Is there a limitation for new construction? Or and how is that based? Good question. So that is a, another mathematical formula that we have to work with Excel when we take a look at the design, the construction of the building. Uh, what are the components going into it? And we also take a look at, we have to look at the habitual pattern of that potential property owner. You know, what have they used before? Is this a person that you know, has the air conditioning running nine months out of the year? Um, is this a person that, um, you know, here's another great example of new construction, putting in an EV car charger. We know that EV car charger is gonna be uh, a drain on that property in terms of the electrical. So we do work with Excel and we come up with uh, what we call hypotheticals and we give them a number. And um, you know, generally, generally we're, we're, we're pretty close. We know on average about 4.5 to 5 kW is gonna be really good for the average home in Minnesota in terms of meeting their electrical needs. Good question. They don't limit it. They only limit it if you are applying and using the Excel rebate. Oh, so you're getting the rebates. Correct. Okay. Yep. However, if you go over 40 kW on a commercial application, it changes your relationship with Excel Energy because now you're becoming, you know, somewhat of an energy producer. And so it allows them ability to go back. They can adjust your, your rate structure, um, your, your utility electrical rate structure. So we kind of really like to stay away from that. Uh, that's when you know the lawyers need to get involved and the conversations need to take place about you know a who's financing that large of a project, b how much is it going to produce, c can we actually take that amount of energy? Can we dump it into the grid? Is the electrical tub on the property going to be large enough to take that load? Is there you know there's a lot of technical things that get in there. And just to clarify, Justin, so mm -hmm. if we have solar on the house and we're generating more than we're using, Excel has to pay us at the retail rate that we would otherwise. The that's same correct. Cost that we would buy kilowatt hours from there. Absolutely. Yep. That's correct. And, and it's the same. That's just for Minnesota, right? That varies from state to state. Um, there's net metering laws, I believe. Doug, do you remember how many states have a net metering law? I don't know. I got like 28 in my mind, but I'm not sure. Yeah, there's about 28 states that have net metering laws. Unfortunately, in Minnesota, you know, we were leaders in net metering in 1983, but we haven't gone back and tweaked this language since 1983. So that's one of the things we're doing at the Capitol also. And, um, and I'm excited to see those changes take place. I think everybody in this room should be excited to see those, take, those, those changes take place because it's going to truly allow our industry, our market to grow. And I'll actually, I'll get into that. How are we doing on time? A couple more minutes? Two minutes. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll jump into, oh, I'll go into this real quick about policy. Um, we talk about subsidies. You know, what's been driving our industry? Well, a lot of subsidies have been driving our industry. When we take a look at the level of subsidies that are taking place, 
the traditional fossil fuels industry receives $70.2 billion in subsidies. And this is everything from oil explora exploration to capping oil wells to creating new technologies to get oil out of the ground. When we take a look at renewables, renewables is subsidized at $12.2 billion. So really, when we hear you know, our pundits talk about, well, you know, this is you know, taking money from my pocket to fund your project, well, let's take a look at the, the bigger elephant in the room, and that is how much are we spending to subsidize oil? So I'm going to jump out of this. There was a mention about community solar. Um, this is an example. This is a project. Uh, MRES uh, received a grant to work on a community solar uh, project here in Excel territory. And uh, this is a project. You can see the outline of the building here. This is a roof covered in modules. And this is actually located uh, hypothetically on the EIC corridor, Energy Innovation Corridor. This is the University Corridor in St. Paul. This project is essentially um, right across from the Menards uh, on, on University. And as I scroll out of this picture, we can actually see the property owner for this building owns two other properties. So we have a potential here for doing community solar. How big is this? This is about 4.6 megawatts. And what's nice is this is a Minnesota made product. And we have a power substation that is basically across the street. So community solar, great opportunities here. You know, we have two models. We have a model that right now Great River Energy has done uh, with its uh, co-op where people can individually buy a module for $800. They can buy one, they can buy 10, they can buy however many they want. This particular model is having people buy into a share of that electricity. So you wouldn't be physically owning the module, but you would have a choice. Do I want to buy energy produced by coal, by wind, or by solar? So again, just a model concept. Um, I believe this was on this project alone, it was 11,000 modules. And uh, this was using one of their newer technologies. This is a 410 watt module with the reflector. And um, I'll jump into a couple of residential here. Um, some of the things to think about on the site, some of the things that we have to do with Excel Energy is we have to map out, we have to do basically a, a, a site map uh, uh, a plan, site diagram, Excel wants to see things to consider in the projects that you were putting together. Where is the closest electrical pole? Or how are we getting electricity to the property? Is it going underground? Is it going above ground? These are the things we need to identify with Excel. They very clearly want to see how the transmission is taking place. They want to see where is the inverter being located. They want to see where is the disconnect switch is being located. All of these things are something to consider. When you start putting an inverter into a house, you need to think about, is it going to be in the mechanical or the electrical room? Is it going to be underneath someone's bedroom? Because sometimes, well, a lot of times, inverters will hum. They'll make some noise. And the last thing we want to do is be worried about a call from somebody because their office or their, or, or their bedroom is right below or next to a wall that has an inverter on it. Um, another project, we did two different technologies. This is in South Minneapolis. Uh, this is again, this is a Minnesota made module. This is 10K solar on a residential roof. Then we have two high performance solar thermal um, uh, panels doing domestic hot water for the house. So this is a project. Um, we completed the solar thermal this fall. Uh, we'll be doing the solar PV um, this, uh, this spring coming up. But very much, you know, it comes into the design criteria, the aesthetics, laying everything out. We have to be very critical, again, about where, you know, where are we putting all of our electrical components. So we have this area right here designated. We have an inverter um, that we want to make sure, again, where it's located. Is it going to be directly in the sun? Is it going to be protected from rain? You know, traditionally these are NEMA 3 rated cabinets, so they're okay to be outside. You know, they're engineered, they're designed to be out in the weather. 
But, you know, we also need to think about what's on the back side of that wall. You know, if that's going to hum or have any sort of vibration. Same thing with the mechanical equipment when we talk about solar thermal. You know, if we have a mechanical room and we have pumps, uh, we have things that are switching on and off, we want to be sensitive to what, is, what, what exactly are, is around that mechanical room. So with that, if there's any other specific questions, oh, here was another quick example. Uh, things to think about. You know, we talk about production meters, AC disconnects. Uh, here's our line power coming in. This one in particular is coming in off of the alley. Uh, things to think about. Uh, the one above it, uh, there are no overhead clearance issues at this site. PV array of 16 10K modules on self-facing roof. We have our azimuth, we have our degrees, combiner box. And then we go even one step further, and that is we have to map out the actual um, electrical one-line diagram with all of our labeling, our meters, our disconnects, everything that's located on the outside of the property. So a lot of information. Any questions? Yeah, we're looking for solar PV. Uh, we're looking on a roof pitch, anything from, you know, we can do a 412 is a little shallow, but like a 612 up to a 1212 or a 1012 is going to work pretty good. So anywhere between, you know, that 30 degree range, actually 25 degrees up to about uh, 35 to 40 degrees is going to be very optimal. If we talk about solar thermal, which is again, solar domestic hot water, we want to see that roof pitch or we want to see that structure on the property be at least 45 degrees. And the reason being for solar thermal is we really want to go after that winter sun. So we want to pitch those modules so they're catching that winter, that winter sun.